grace is gained righteousness at Christ's expense. The grace of God is not generic. There is a dimension of grace. Grace is God choosing to bless us rather than curse us as our sin deserves. From Latin, price paid. Mercy is loving the unlovable and forgiving the unforgivable. So the grace of God gives you the ability to accept, to act, to appreciate, and to adore Christ. Realizing that forgiveness is setting a prisoner free and discovering that that prisoner is me. everyone welcome to the happiest place in the online world welcome to feast at home come on and help me greet everybody as part of our month-long anniversary celebration here at our feast you know last week in case you didn't attend we gave a word that you would bring home a little assignment so to speak and the word was bring you remember that bring we ask you to bring one and bless one so my question is did you bring somebody today? Somebody new to the feast? Somebody who might be far away from the Lord? If you did, thank you so much for doing that. Thank you for participating in that little activity. But if not, hey, you can still catch up. You can still do that within the whole month of July. This can be your little gift to our spiritual family to bring someone so that God can bless that someone. All right? So if our word last Sunday was bring, here's our word for today. Bless. That's right, bless. How can we best bless and encourage others? Well, there are many different ways, but one of the best ways we can bless people is through our giving. So here's our assignment for this week. I want you to write this down so you don't forget. Your homework for this week is this. Bless One Mercy Ministry. Very simple, right? We would like to ask you to choose one mercy ministry from, from, from all the list of mercy ministries that our community supports and then bless that ministry th through your giving. We have listed all the mercy ministries in our official website. All you need to do is just copy and proceed to this link right now and you will see the different ministries that we have and all the different ways you can give. Just message us, by the way, in our FB page about your donation. And then let us know which ministry you'd like that to be credited to so we can do that afterwards, okay? Let this be your little expression of love to Brother Bo, who he himself has given his lifelong support to all of these ministries, all right? This is our little gift to him and our community, of course. And with that, let us proclaim and declare our favorite family prayer here at the feast as we come together. Join me in the symbol of our faith, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Everybody say this with me. Today, I receive all of God's love for me. Today, I open myself to the unbounded, limitless, overflowing abundance of God's universe. Today, I open myself to God's blessings and healings and miracles. Today, I open myself to God's word so that I become more like Jesus every day. Today, I proclaim that I'm God's beloved, I am God's servant, and I'm God's powerful champion. And because I am blessed, I am blessing the world in Jesus' name. Amen. All together, everybody, let's sing in honor of God's word as we say, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path to bless us with the word of God today. Everybody give a big hands up to Brother Bo Sanchez. Hi everybody, God bless you. God bless you as you join the feast and you continue to receive His blessing, His grace. And I'm praying for you, for your home, for your family that you receive more of His love today. Welcome back to our incredibly wonderful, exciting study of Matthew. And today, I want to preach the message, spit it out. <laughs> that, that's right. It's like, oh, Brother Bo, that's gross. No, I want you to think about it, that if there is anything that is killing you, you, you want to spit out that thing. Now, question. Have you ever experienced being choked? 
And no, I'm not saying somebody's strangling you, but something like a piece of food, you know, blocked your air, 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 air pipe. Have you ever experienced that? I haven't, but I witnessed one and man, it's scary. I was eating in a restaurant and then there was this guy in front of me and, 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 and he, he suddenly froze and then he held his throat and he was trying to make a sound, but he could not make a sound. And his face started turning as, like, like red as a tomato. And I knew he was in trouble. And I said, oh, oh, this guy's choking, this guy's choking. And then I got scared, you know why? Because I didn't know what I was gonna do. Like, I, I kind of like heard that there was this maneuver that you're supposed to do, the, the Heimlich, 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 whatever, how you pronounce that thing. And I said, oh no, I don't know what to do. And then the other thing was that he was extra large. Like I said, shouldn't I like go behind him and then wrap my arm around him and then give some abdominal thrusts and like, do I, do I lift him up, up, up from the floor? How, how will I do that? He's 280 pounds. I mean, he didn't know what to do. But thanks be to God, on his own, he was able, you know, through violent grunting, he was able to spit out that thing. And man, did he spit it hard. Like, like the, the piece of meat flew to the next restaurant. I'm exaggerating, but you know what? If I was in his shoes, I would spit it out hard too if I knew it was gonna kill me. My dear friend, oh, by the way, just want you to know that I studied later. How should you do? How should you react when somebody is? So I found out everything I knew about the Heimlich, uh, I don't even know how to pronounce that thing, um, um, what you should do. You know, everything that I knew was wrong. Um, what you're supposed to do was like you encourage the person to cough, to bend over, and then you give some big wallops at the back. Anyway, uh, this is not a health talk. I want you to know, that you, you might be wondering, wh where are we going with this, Brother Bo? T.D. Jakes talked about unforgiveness like it was choking. You know, put it this way. I, I want to share this with you. Very, very important point. Um, when you have bitterness, resentment, in Tagalog, sama ng loob, it's like a blockage in your spiritual windpipe. That God's supply of love and joy and peace and power cannot flow in your life unless you remove that obstacle. Friend, that's why when it comes to unforgiveness, you must spit it out, and you must spit it out hard. You know that thing called unforgiveness, bitterness, resentment? It's killing you. And, and if you know that, you're going to remove it from your life. Today, we're going to open the word. Are you ready with me? Lift up your hand, lift up your heart as you sing with me. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. We're gonna read Matthew chapter 18, verse 21. Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how often should I forgive someone who sins against me? Seven times? I want you to remember that question, seven times? Peter was groping for an upper limit to forgiving others. Now, during that time, there were rabbis who were saying, based on an interpretation from the prophet Amos in the Old Testament, they were teaching, if somebody offends you three times, you have to forgive him. But the moment he offends you the fourth time, you are in no obligation whatsoever to forgive him. So Peter, what he was doing was he was trying to impress Jesus. You know, he, 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 what he did was he doubled the requirement to six and then he added one more as extra bogey points, you know? So he was probably expecting Jesus to say when he asked seven times, you know, he was expecting Jesus to say, wow, Peter, Wow, you're holy monaman, you know? But he probably was very shocked when Jesus said, not seven times, but 77, 70 times seven. And in the Bible, seven is already a number of completeness, of totality. And yet when you say 70 times seven, my gosh, it is a metaphor for the kind of, the, the attitude of forgiveness that has 
no limits. Now, friend, I know our reality is not like that. I mean, I talk to people who have been deeply hurt and been deeply hurt many, many, many times. You know what they say? They say the same thing. Brother Bo, ayoko na. Tama na. Sobra na. I can, I've forgiven him too many times. And so, so you have this two realities. On one hand, our own human limitation to forgive. Hindi ko na kaya, Brother Bo. And then you've got this call from Jesus, not seven times, Peter, but 70 times seven, no limits. So here are limitations and here, and by the way, can I share this with you? As I was reading this, one of my reflections, early reflections, like the, one of the first times I read this, read this passage as a young Christian, let me share with you my, my jubilation. <laughs> when I read this, I said, Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Jesus is telling us to forgive without limits? Yay! I'll tell you why. Because when I was a young Christian, I, I would get so frustrated with myself because I kept on sinning and sinning and sinning against God. And in my mind, all right, in my mind I was saying, I'm probably hitting the limit of God's forgiveness. I, I, I'm reaching this point where God says, Tama na, sobra na, ayoko na. You know, and, and, and I, I really felt that. But then I read this passage and Jesus says, I, I'm, I'm saying if Jesus expects us to forgive without limits, that meant in my young Christian mind, God does not have any limits to forgiving us. Wow. And I, I, something was released in my spirit, like, Yes, God will continue to forgive me and love me and, 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 I, and he's going to transform me. So anyway, anyway, back to, back to the original message of this. Um, so what should we do? How should we reconcile our own limitations to forgive and God's call to forgive without limits? Let, let me answer it in this way. Let me nuance the debate in this way. That there are limits to friendship, but there are no limits to forgiveness. What does that mean? I'm sure you've heard me share this before, but I'm, I keep on saying it because I want to avoid people. Every time there's a teaching on forgiveness, I want people to avoid this catastrophic misunderstanding because friendship and forgiveness are two different things. What does that mean? God wants you to forgive everyone without limits. We'll explain later why. At the, at the second part of this talk. But when you forgive, it does not mean, I, re I repeat, when you forgive, it does not mean that you will bring back the level of friendship that you had before you were wronged. Because forgiveness is given, but trust is earned. I, let me say that again. Forgiveness is given, but trust is earned. Two examples. You have a business partner. You know, you trusted him. And then he swindles you. He cheats you. He steals from you. And, and I, I can think of one person who was telling me that, you know. He was saying, Brother Bo, we were eating together in one table. Ninong ng mga anak ko. You know, business partner. Trust that. And then all of a sudden, he, he, he does all sorts of crazy things to steal from, from this person. Anyway, what should you do? Forgive. You should forgive that person. God wants you to forgive. Why? Because it's a blockage in your windpipe, in your spiritual windpipe. And, and God wants to give you love, joy, and peace, and it's going to block. So you need to forgive. You need to forgive. You need to forgive. You need to forgive. But should you make him your business partner again? I don't think so. He's got to win your trust again, if ever. So it's a second question. I hope you're, you're, okay, last example, boyfriend. You love him. You trust him. And then he becomes unfaithful to you. And you catch him red-handed. He had a second girlfriend. What should you do? You're deeply hurt. My <laughs> encouragement to you, you've got to forgive him. There is no other way. Or else it, there, there will be this permanent block in, in your life. That you will, you know, you're, no, you've got to set yourself free and you've got to forgive this person. Um, but should you make him your boyfriend again? No, that's a, that's a second discernment. 
if he repents, if he, if he decides to, you know, win back your trust and, and he shows evidence of, of uh, a change, a transformation in his life, perhaps. But again, that is a decision that you've got to make and it's separate from forgiveness. So I hope I made that clear and continue to open your heart because this talk will get even better. Forgiveness is unlimited. Forgiveness is unlimited. Only forgiveness. That's right. That's what we're learning from this passage that we are studying. By the way, thank you so much, Brother Bo, for that message. What we are learning is that there is no ceiling when it comes to forgiveness. Now, why is that? Well, Jesus explains it in a very beautiful parable. I want us to go now and study this. It's in Matthew chapter 18. I want you to go to verse 23 and it says, Jesus says, Therefore, the kingdom of heaven can be compared with a king who decided to bring his accounts up to date with servants who had borrowed money from him. Now, take note. In Greek, the word used for servant also means a ruler or manager that served under the king. All right? So it's not just a lowly servant, but it could also be a ruler. But that person ruled under the king. Now, let's continue. Verse 24. In the process, one of his debtors was brought in who owed him millions of pounds. All right? Let me pause just, just uh, right about this time and then explain. It says here that there was this person who owed him millions of pounds. Isn't that what it says? He, he was brought in who owed him millions of pounds. Now, in the original Greek manuscript, it used the word 10,000 talents. Now, what is a talent? During that time, one talent was equivalent to, get this, 15,000 years of wages. <laughs> That's crazy. That's why, you know, 10,000 talents was actually a preposterous. It was an insane figure. It was an unrealistic number. If you were listening to the story back then, you would probably laugh in the face of Jesus. In fact, in biblical times, the total revenue of, of the entire province of Galilee, guess, get this, it was only 300 talents. So 10,000 talents was a crazy figure for a personal debt. Okay, one commentary said that if you convert that amount to today's money, it wouldn't be worth millions. It would be worth trillions. <laughs> That's crazy. Anyway, here's what happens next. Let's read. It says in verse 25, he couldn't pay, naturally, right? He couldn't pay. So his master ordered that he be sold along with his wife, his children, and everything he owned to pay the debt. Meaning? Meaning he and his family would be sold as slaves. But then it says in verse 26, But the man fell down before his master and begged him, Please be patient with me, and I will pay it all. Then this master was filled with pity for him, and he released him and forgave his debt. You know what? I love this story. Because Jesus was actually describing God's mercy in great detail to the world. God's mercy, listen to this. God's mercy is so big that even if you owe him such a crazy preposterous amount, maybe you might have sinned against him in a big way. Maybe you might have committed adultery. Maybe you might have stolen something from somebody. Maybe you've been unfaithful to him. Jesus says that the Lord forgives those who fall on their knees before him. God wipes away the debt completely. See, this is the mercy of God. It's what we receive every single day of our lives. It's, it's illogical. It's irrational. It's completely undeserved. But I praise God for His mercy. If you are grateful for God's mercy, you know, I cannot imagine where any of us would be right now if it were not for the mercy of God. Let's thank Him for He is merciful towards us. Amen, somebody. But you know what? The story doesn't actually end with the servant being forgiven by the king. All right? It doesn't end there. This story doesn't have a happily ever after ending. But it's got, a, it's got a great lesson, all right? That's what's more important. Because after the servant leaves the presence of the king, something happens. The servant sees his friend who also owed him money. But you know what? He doesn't respond the way that the king responds. On the contrary, his reaction to the friend was the exact opposite. Okay, let's read. It's in verse 28. It says, But when the man left the king, this is the servant, he went to a fellow servant, who owed him a few thousand pounds. And he grabbed him by the throat and demanded instant payment. Now, I want you to take note that this guy, what, what he was doing was that he was choking. All right? He was choking his fellow servant. Now, 
the, the, the fellow servant fell down before him, verse 29, and begged for a little more time. Be patient with me, and I will pay it, he pleaded. Kind of reminds you of the first script. But then in verse 30, it says, But his creditor wouldn't wait. He had the man arrested and put in prison until the debt could be paid in full. When some of the other servants saw this, they were very upset. So they went to the king and told him everything that had happened. Then the king called in the man, that man who he had forgiven, and said, You evil servant, I forgave you that tremendous debt because you pleaded with me. Shouldn't you have mercy on your fellow servant just as I had mercy on you? Then the angry king sent the man to prison to be tortured until he had paid his entire debt. That's what my heavenly father will do to you if you refuse to forgive your brothers and sisters from your heart. Very importantly, I'm sure that some of you are probably already grasping the lessons as, I, as, I, as we read the word, but very quickly, let me give you now four compelling reasons why you should forgive especially if you have unforgiveness right now, here are four reasons why you need to forgive that someone. And I pray that you receive this with an open heart. Okay, number one, because forgiving others is a natural response to God's generosity. It really is. How many of you believe that God is a generous God? Anybody? Come on. God is generous. Here's the truth. You cannot outgive God. That is basic truth. The moment you try to outgive Him, guess what? That's the same moment that you will fail. Because you just can't outgive God. You owe your entire life to the Lord. In the presence of God, my dear friend, we are but mere beggars who are desperately in need of His grace and His mercy. But you know, sometimes we like to fool ourselves into think th thinking that we are actually rulers. But in reality, we are all beggars. So the question is, how can we, who are but mere beggars, who, whose every breath comes from the Lord, not be generous to other beggars? That's why the only response to God's outward generosity is also generosity towards others. I believe that that's the reason why Jesus gave an impossible amount to be paid in this story. Why? Because He knows that we can never repay the Lord. We can try all we want, but we will never be able to do it. But maybe, just maybe, with the love that we have received, we can extend that same love to others. Which leads us now to the second lesson. The second lesson why you should forgive that person is because forgiving others is a natural response to God's mercy. That's beautiful. And you know, I love this quote from my very good friend. His name is, I don't know if you know him, his, his name is William Barclay. <laughs> he says, William says, whatever wrong others have done to us is small. It's nothing. It's inconsequential compared to the wrong that we have done to the Lord. And you know what? I could not agree more. How many of you agree with William? I want you to imagine this little scenario, okay? If one day, just imagine, I, I, I suddenly slap our next door neighbor. Just one day, okay? Randomly. The worst that they could probably do to me is to report me to the local barangay officials. And the worst thing that they can probably do is, you know, I could be slapped with a little fine and then be given a warning. But, you know, on the other hand, if by some strange occurrence, I'm able to pass through, for example, the White House security and manage to enter into the Oval Office and then all of a sudden slap the President of the United States in the face. What do you think will happen to me? Will I just be called and be sent to the Barangay office? I don't think so. Whatever wrong thing anybody has done to you, it's nothing compared to what you have done against the Lord. Our sins are big. Why? Because we sin against the big God. And yet, it's so mind-blowing how this big God somehow still chooses to forgive us in a big way. When I think about all the times that God forgave me when He should have punished me, I cannot help but pay it forward. Because when we receive God's mercy, you know, the only natural response is to be merciful to others as well. Or, or maybe let, it, let me say it this way. Forgiving others is a direct response to God's mercy. It's a way of saying thank you to the Lord for being merciful to us. And I'm, I'm saying this because, you know, there are a lot of people who are unable to forgive others simply because either they haven't received the forgiveness of the Lord or they don't realize that they need forgiveness. They're like, why will I need God's forgiveness? I'm a good person. It's not like I murdered or killed somebody. Okay, listen to me. Those who refuse to give mercy forfeit their right 
to receive mercy because this is exactly what Jesus was explaining. He preached this in the story. The king punished the servant who refused to extend that same mercy that he received to his fellow servant. So if you're not, un if you're not able to forgive, you might forfeit the, the right to actually be forgiven. Okay, I hope that this is blessing you. Here's the third reason why you should forgive. Because forgiving is the most natural way of healing ourselves. I want you to look at these props. Okay? These are, take a look at this. These, these are chains. It, it's not an accessory. It's not a necklace. It's a, it's a chain. It's actually a dog chain because I couldn't find you know, a real life chain. But it's a chain. In the olden times, this is how... You know, they, 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 they jailed people. They would chain them by the neck. They would chain them by the arms. They would chain them by the, by the foot. And they would shackle people to prevent them from escaping. Nowadays, we use handcuffs, right? But, you know, let me say this. Unforgiveness is a shackle. It's a chain. And people who are incapable of forgiving people often end up imprisoning themselves and chaining themselves in the process. But here's the shocking part, all right? You're not the only one imprisoned. Take a look at this photo. You are actually chained to the person whom you cannot forgive. I mean, think about this for a moment. When you don't forgive, everywhere you go, you take that person with you. Every time you hear his name or her name, your peace goes out the window and your blood pressure shoots up to the sky. So in essence, you know, unforgiveness actually chains you together with that person that you are unable to forgive. So what do you need to do? Release yourself from the chains. You release yourself from this prison. Forgive and then watch how your heart heals little by little. This will allow God's grace to also flow again into your life. All right, this is my encouragement. We're down now to the last and the fourth reason why you need to forgive. Here it is. Because forgiveness should be as natural as breathing. What does that even mean, Brother Audi? Well, breathing is one of the most natural things that you can do. You don't even have to think about it, right? You don't have to think like, I need to breathe right now. If I don't breathe, then I die. No, you don't even have to think about it. It just happens naturally. Your body knows that it needs to breathe in oxygen again and again in order to survive. The moment you are breathing no longer and it's no longer natural, that's when you know that there is a problem, right? Your respiratory system might already be compromised. Did you know that God also created within you a spiritual respiratory system? Uh-huh. It's called forgiveness. See, the way that forgiveness works is that you inhale forgiveness and then exhale forgiveness. And as you inhale God's forgiveness, you exhale that forgiveness to others. But here's the thing. The moment you stop inhaling and also exhaling, and the moment you stop exhaling and inhaling, what happens? You die right? It works both ways. You need to do both things. You need to receive God's forgiveness in order to forgive others, and you need to forgive others in order to receive God's forgiveness. If God forgives us every day, then God also expects us to forgive others every single day. Otherwise, we stop breathing. We start choking. You can't breathe because there's a, there's a blockage stopping you. There's, there's a blockage stopping the grace of God. That's why your spirit might not be flowing because God's grace is not flowing and because you're choking. You, you turn to others around you and then you start choking them too. Just like the servant in the story who started grabbing somebody by the throat and demanded instant payment. But in case, you know, you can't resist getting mad at someone, I want you to listen to what, to what St. Paul says. This is beautiful. Paul says, don't let the sun go down while you are still angry. I want you to know that Paul is saying that it's okay to get angry. In fact, you know, Jesus got angry a few times. It's just basic human emotion. But Paul says, don't let the sun go down while you are still angry. Do you know what that means? Okay, let me explain this. That means that you only have till 559 to be angry and then after 559 you've got to spit out that anger you've got to let it go and it doesn't even matter who you are mad at you can be mad at your spouse your child your friend your boss your your ministry leader or that person who cut in line in front of you that person who laughed at you 
but your anger should have an expiration date. It's supposed to have a limited shelf life. It's not supposed to be stocked up there forever. Otherwise, you know, you might not have room to have peace in your heart. So for the sake of your peace and for the sake of your joy, set your alarm before the sun goes down. Have a cutoff point for your anger because, my friend, you are not designed to end the day with bitterness and resentment. So please let it go. Let it go. Spit it out. Not because they're innocent, not because they're right, not because they deserve it, but because you want to receive the gift of healing. Forgiveness is a gift that you give yourself. Can I get an amen from somebody? Okay, let me close. Let me close. I want to wrap up now. In this story, Jesus says that God is a king who will collect what is due him. God always collects in his proper time, in the right time. God will collect because God is a just God. He's a just king. And you know what? I'm glad that God is just. And not only that, God is also merciful. St. John says that Jesus is full of grace and truth. John chapter 1, verse 14. Another word for grace is mercy. And another word for truth is justice. Isn't that who Jesus is? He's full of mercy and he's full of justice. And you know what? I am so glad that he is both mercy and justice. And you will be too, the moment I tell you why. We need both justice and mercy in our life. And I'm going to explain to you, and I pray that you receive this the way I received it this week. Okay, here it is. We should be glad that Jesus is just. Why? Because without justice, there would be no order in the universe. You know, you would be punished for no reason whatsoever. Because justice says that you are right to be punished for the wrong that you did. Okay, that's why I'm grateful for God's justice. But what I really need is God's mercy. Because mercy is that part of God's heart that says, it's right for me to punish you, but because you came to me in humility, instead, let me forgive you. How many of you are grateful that God's mercy steps in whenever you need it the most? Come on. Today, if you are <coughs> choking, if you're choking because of the unforgiveness that's clogging up, your spiritual lungs, let's ask the Lord to give us a spiritual Heimlich maneuver. Let Him remove this obstruction. And in order for Him to do that, you need to let it go. Okay, it's up to you. So in God's presence, I invite you to spit out all your hurts. Spit out all your grudges. Spit it out. Spit out your trauma. Spit out your resentment. Spit out that bitterness. Because it's time to let the air in again because it's time to breathe in once again. Are you ready to receive God's grace? Are you ready for mercy to flow in again into your life? Then let's pray and let's worship the Lord. Father, we thank you for the word that has given us new meaning and given us good breath. We thank you, Lord, and we receive it right now as we open our hearts, our, as we open our hearts to receive your mercy. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much for watching. If you like this video, don't forget to click the like button and tell people and all your friends and family about the inspiration they can receive here. And remember to subscribe and click the bell icon so that you get notified when we're going to upload the next inspiring video.